almost feel like I don't have to bother to give a talk now, which is the best kind of introduction. Um, let's see, make sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so, tonight I'm going to show um, two different trajectories of work that, um, that reflect a kind of contemporary interest in plasticity and um, try to, through the framing of the work in the talk, to kind of draw out some of the principles that I think um, are of interest in working in a kind of highly plastic way. So I'll outline two trajectories of work. The first results from the challenges of practice, the second from the opportunities of academic research. And I'll attempt to argue that both of these lines of work are shaped by, as I said, plasticity. But here I'm referring to the capacity of a material to transform under the pres pressure of external force, not simply as an index of that force, but rather as a route to the invention of new material experiences. And I'll outline that more clearly as we move through the talk. Um, in order to describe contemporary plasticity with the robustness I believe it has, it's important to both define what I'm, how I'm using the terms material and force. So material is, the, is matter that's physically present. And as Anna alluded to, it's both um, the stuff that we organize in space, the kind of materials we organize, and the representational um, material that we bring to those real materials. And that, that, that matter is distributed in forms that in my work range from particles to sheets to volumes. Material operates directly on the senses and not necessarily in natural or singular ways. So wood, for example, or more precisely its cellulose fiber, has many material manifestations from paper to lumber framing to shear resistant panels, etc. Its character or materiality shifts depending on the geometries of its distribution and also the other systems with which it interacts. Because an architectural experience, a fully developed atmosphere, results from the commingling of multiple material systems interacting with one another and our sensing bodies. So force, then, is the energy that is exerted on material in both natural and synthetic ways. So natural, when I talk about natural forces, I'm including gravity, thermal energy, and wind, and synthetic forces like economy, use, and um, both design and manufacturing methods. Increasingly, um, material is transformed by technological force, such as mass production, digital techniques, and methods of fabrication. So for my generation of designers and yours, much of this energy is applied using digital control, which is channeled through either a CNC machine, an inkjet printer, or finite element analysis software. So under the pressure of these synthetic forces, material presents different qualities, negotiates natural forces in unexpected ways, and is reconfigured. So natural force persists, but our approach to addressing it changes. And, and increasingly, I argue that materials are liberated from the conventional forms that they've taken because those forms were optimized under the pressure of different technological regime, regimes. Um, so uh, I want to make it clear that I'm interested in how um, our current technologies impact material experience, not because I'm an uncritical technophile, um, to the contrary, I'm up here sporting a five-year-old laptop. But rather, I'm um, an architect in search of new material exper experiences. 
and I hope that you'll see in the work I show that I'm wildly curious about technology's transformative effects on the real. So the first two projects I'll show you are part of the professional trajectory. It's, um, I'll show you one site with two different design proposals, two houses designed for the same client on the same site, both of which work with um, form in a plastic way, but to different formal and atmospheric ends. The site is um, a thousand feet above the bluffs um, in Malibu, overlooking the Pacific. Physically, the hillside site, which you can see in a bird's eye view here, this is the kind of surrounding topography. It, it's um, a flat parcel in a very rugged terrain. There are um, stunning views in all directions, but legally the site is incredibly burdened by development restrictions. It's located at the edge of a major landslide zone and in the path of frequent wildfires, and the numerous planning bodies charged with its oversight would rather see nothing developed here. So this is looking back at the site. You can see what the topography is doing behind it. This is the first proposal for this client called the Malibu House, developed in my former practice called New Form with my former partner, Jason Payne. The project's form, structure, and skin respond in large part to the constraints of the site. The house is limited to, its, to the area, height, volume, and even weight of the former house that existed on the site until a fire destroyed it in 1993. The design process that we used to develop the project was um, quite similar to um, the sort of morphological analysis of Darcy Thompson, who, who studied the, the kind of context in which different species of, of, this, of related animals developed. So in this case, these diagrams are showing the change in light levels in the stream beds that these crayfish developed in. And so because we, we had very particular parameters regarding volume and square footage and a desire to, um, with one surface, regulate both exterior unconditioned space and interior conditioned space, we settled on a Klein bottle topological model to help us use the same system for describing both types of space. And, um, and the kind of surfaces of this study generated a series of structural studies to look for um, and translate that surface through the kind of intelligence of different structural systems. So all of that which you see here is discarded along the way, um, and many others, which I'll show. This is just a site plan of the house. You can see um, in plan, it's a torus-shaped house. It's a bit like a torus that's been snipped and, and, um, and rests on itself. And the center is an empty open-air courtyard. And um, <coughs> there is the surface of the project is, is transformed in relation to where occupation occurs, either under it, halfway um, up within the torus, or on top of the torus. And because the torus is snipped, the kind of eastern elevation gives you access to the courtyard, which is part of an entry sequence. So these are other structural systems which um, really had a difficult time contending with the fact that the form of the house had a variable relationship to the ground as you moved around it. So in some places the form touched the ground, in others it bridged above the, above the ground, and in still others it, it rested on top of itself. 
So most of these studies were um, sort of pure structural, more pure in their in their structural exploration. So in the upper left-hand corner is a, a kind of grid shell that's attached to a floor plate, which made it incredibly difficult for us to um, accommodate the second floor which exists in the proposal. So we went through a variety of studies searching for a structural system robust enough to deal with these um, variable uh, elevations with which occupants um, exist within or on the torus. So the, the kind of scheme that was developed after schematic des at the end of schematic design was, was basically this one, which is a single um, spiraling floor plate that wraps on itself constructing two floors and then a shell that slips over the top of that. And the floor plan um, here, you can see number five, this is the courtyard space. So you come in under the house, the courtyard is open to the air, you come into a living room and you can either move up to a large master suite upstairs or you can move into a kitchen and outdoor dining area which is involuted into the shell. And then upstairs, when you arrive at the top of the plate, you can either switch back and occupy a kind of um, roof terrace that's nestled into the top of the form, or you can go into a series of spaces which makes the master suite. Um, this is a kind of worm's eye perspective of the shell from underneath. And for me, maybe this, the most plastic system of the project, um, aside from the, the exterior surface of the project, was its structural system. Because after the series of studies that you saw um, in, in development and construction documents, we had to develop a structural system that could evolve in the face of these variable loading conditions. So I'll show you a series, a structural model that we did to sort of test the assembly and configuration of, of this system. In the upper right, you can see what our 38, um, 5 8 inch thick plasma cut steel ribs and their depth varies. The average depth of any given rib is six inches. Its maximum depth is something like 10 inches, but it's only five-eighths of an inch. So it's an incredibly thin rib, which then, um, because it's plasma cut and isn't a component that, um, you know, a linear-based component, it's possible to manipulate the profiles of that system in order to accommodate a roof terrace up above or in order to um, stretch across the space to support a second floor, um, et cetera. So in number two, you see a, a, the addition of, to that system of a series of lateral, timber laterals which give shear resistance and rigidity to this um, series of ribs. And then in number three, you see the addition of a series of diagonals, which um, allow us to remove all um, sheathing that acts in shear from the project. And instead, a series of diagonal braces gives further rigidity to the um, frame. And to make clear the, the structural solution was as much an outcome of geometric desire as it was um, uh, building regulation. Because this house had a really tight weight limit, there was no way to do a kind of concrete shell or um, a monolithic um, surface active structure because our parameters wouldn't allow that to happen. Um, then in number four, you see what is the skin of the building added to this structural system, which is just an aesthetic and waterproof layer. 
and then you see a series of round aperture which get um, cut into the shell of the building whenever the diagonal braces are absent. And that happens in a particular way, um, which I'll explain further. So these are a series of the series of steel profiles, and you can see, you know, this is a roof deck profile. Um, this is the two-story master living over kitchen profile. Um, there's a particular profile which is much shorter anywhere the torus doesn't contact the ground. And this is a roof plan which shows the array of those um, ribs in plan. Um, then the other thing that's slightly interesting, interesting to me because I like solving these sort of complex formal problems is that there are, um, there is a kind of difficulty of creating uh, lateral continuities because you need, because the rib is so thin, you need to make sure that you're lining up all of your geometries across those ribs. And so a lot like, um, you know, similar to the way a dressmaker would have to manage darting to change the surface area in a garment, the geometry, the structural geometry has to branch and add more geometry where surface area increases or be pared down in order to decrease the amount of material when the cross section shrinks. Um, so to kind of explain, this diagram is to explain the structural evolution of the project. Um, the standard rib isn't really shown here because I think in the end all of the standard rib profiles are erased, but there's basically a kind of arch action in the rib which keeps it very, keeps its depth minimized. And um, depending on where you are, if you're at the raised area of the torus, you have a rib that sits on a kind of structural bridge. If you are at a two-story area, the rib gets a series of plates which make it work more like a compressive uh, columnar member. And if you're um, at the living room and roof deck above, then the kind of ergonomics of occupation at the roof deck uh, transform the rib profile. So this is just a, the structural model we did to test all of those shapes and to test what the assembly of those parts would be like in a kind of scaled version. And here, you know, the parts are, the ribs are a little thicker than they would be in reality. And we learned about, you know, their tendency to deflect in the order of operations for erecting this. Um, but this is the entry side with the torus bridging over your access to the courtyard. Um, which is basically showing number one. And then this is the two-story area with the two-story, uh, the second story of bedroom, which is uh, number two. And then this area here is number three, which is the roof deck, which is sort of pushing into the ceiling of the living room below. And then all of the, um, this entire shell of parts is held together because the floor holds the two sides of the shell together um, and also one of these uh, laterals holds the whole thing together like a tension ring. So the parts have to perform differently depending on where they are and so there are, um, there are similarities <coughs> between the parts but their roles and the way they perform work structural work varies from area to area because of the um, relationship of this mass to the landscape. So this is just sort of moving you around that model. And then um, this is where I get, I'm sort of professional and being, I'm nerding out a little bit on this part of the project, but um, 
This is a sort of unrolled elevation of all the steel ribs, and you can see the sort of diagonal flow of the brace members, and then you can see um, every other kind of bay gives you a diagonal flow of round windows. So, so the there's a tight correlation between the um, resistance um, to force and load flow in the house and the location of aperture. So instead of kind of putting in a big deep header to compromise the shell, we just located aperture where the shell sort of naturally allowed it. Um, and the only exception to that is our kind of panoramic view of the ocean, which is this large area here. So all of these round windows give you sort of strange glimpses of the landscape, whether it be a ridge line or um, uh, uh, the landscape of a kind of natural hillside or an ocean view. And this was sort of the atmospheric inspiration for the way those apertures would work inside of the form. And then here are a series of elevations of showing how those apertures work on the, on the, across the shell and views of some of the interior <coughs> surfaces. And one of the things that we really appreciated about the aperture is that the, because the apertures are arrayed diagonally, they, they put the eye in closer contact with the wall to ceiling transition because your eye sort of slides along those surfaces and is always moving up diagonally instead of sort of um, out horizontally, um, which is uh, very much like the experience of inhabiting this very three-dimensional landscape. And then the last thing I was going to show with this project was just some very preliminary studies for how to manage um, the surface air, the <coughs> surface clouding of the project um, without forming a series of panels that were each unique from one another. So in most of the renderings, this is not visualized because it was developed more as a system than it was tested thoroughly. Um, across these surfaces. And as a system, the idea was that we would limit ourselves to 12 inch high copper shingles that would come in, that we would produce in three different widths. And we would use what are a series of uh, darts, basically, I'm looking for one here. Um, I'm not sure you can see any here, but um, this is be what's called in garment making a godet. So the surface area is coming up, but because it's inflected here, there's much more surface area here than back here. And so there are extra bands of shingles that are inserted here until the pattern can keep going. And conversely, whenever it shrinks, you just slide, you just let one of these um, ribbons of shingles stop. And we arrayed these in relation to the way rainwater would move over the surface to, to intentionally um, promote the, the patina and coloration of the project um, being heightened in areas where the form received and collected water and to slow it down in areas where water typically didn't uh, shed over the form. And then here is a series of sections showing the space of the project. The ribs, um, all of, because we're accountable for all of the thicknesses of the area we're building, there's some structural efficiencies in these kind of pillowed rib forms which help us minimize the depths at our ceiling and wall. So um, I'm going to show you the second house now, which is a project um, developed in my office, my current office. 
And um, the first project, I think because of the, the developmental, the development restrictions on that particular site and the, um, and the unusual qualities of that design, the project was, for a number of reasons, I think the, the county stopped the project. And the main reason they gave was that the project was a two-story building and it had a roof deck and that was not part of the kind of grandfather development permissions that the new owner would be extended. And so they required, they gave us a more restrictive height limit um, and put a kind of tighter bounding box on us, um, I think in order to try to get something that looked like a house um, on the site. And so the project probably looks more like a house. This is the um, what I have called the Vortex House. It's a one-story scheme for the same client. It shares some attributes with the earlier scheme. Um, it has an, a, a pretty dynamic uh, spatial configuration. It's five-sided, which takes advantage of the 200-degree ocean views on this side and gives you more, um, more surface area contact with the views beyond, the kind of mountainous views beyond. There's a courtyard in the center, and most of the work of the project is done by what is a folded um, roof surface, uh, which is covered in at the, which is covered in zinc, but which presents its underside to the spaces below, so that the space of the house is always expanding or contracting in relation to that roof plane. Um, so the, the project's ambition lies in its dramatic spatial modulation and the saturation of its interior with the visual and geometric material of the site. Um, rather than understanding the views as a way to release the interior to the exterior. The surrounding ge geometric and topographic features are drawn into the interior to condition its atmosphere. Artificial and natural geometries are characterized as of the same fluid medium and the house of vortex into which this material is drawn. This ambition um, really informed each part of the house's organization. It's five-sided uh, massing, it's folded roofscape, it's exterior wrapper and aperture, aperture and it's covered patios. Um, and I'm not sure it, how well I can make this argument, but I'm um, trying to uh, sort of invert, invert the kind of uh, direction of vision that in um, more in modernist work really extended the constructed territory of the house out into the landscape in, but really understood that the landscape was something that architecture framed and was distinctly different from the spaces architecture constructed. In, um, and this house, mostly because of its kind of dramatic uh, landscape in Acapulco, which is, doesn't look so dissimilar from the one we are dealing with, um, frames the landscape with this, this is a Lautner house, the Arango house, frames the landscape with this large, curving, inclined plane and tucks um, the residents underneath the terrace which is under that plane. So surveying the landscape in its purest form happens on the roof of the house and then the occupation of the house happens on this other strata. And its contact, you know, its interface with actual landscape is, you know, most organized on this terrace plane while the house below 
um, is kind of tucked under that surface. And in, in the case of this project, I'm really interested in a kind of rhythmic correlation between the forms of the ceiling plane, the forms of the profile of the house, the profiles and geometries of its aperture, and the distant geometries, so that the natural and the man-made get kind of mixed up with one another and are not so easily separated at, in, the, in one's visual, or visual field or spatial experience. This is um, a view of the house from the north side, and it's kind of a, you know, as all renderings are, a little bit fake in order to show what's happening. But um, a thousand feet down and making a, a pretty strong um, field of, of field in your vision is the ocean surface, and then the kind of rugged bluffs move around the house on three sides. And um, this is a plan of the house showing how the spaces are organized. You slip in under the roof um, into a kind of entry area into um, the living room and kitchen. And uh, here is a courtyard space around which you circulate to get to two bedrooms, a series of bathrooms. Um, and from this living room space is, uh, is the kind of patio that they're allowed to build, which is conditioned just, it's spatial um, experiences like that of the living room, but it's an unconditioned exterior space. And down below is a series of diagrams which reveal the underside of the folded roof surface that makes, um, that basically defines, which is the main, um, gives the main definition to the space of each room. This is the southwest view of the house. This is the covered patio, um, the roof, and then some of the aperture and a, a deck that surrounds most of the house and acts to move water away from the house. And then the aperture are located both in relation to the geometries of the distant views and also as a way of manipulating in a more passive way the way um, breezes and air move through the project and are kind of how and manipulate how warm air exits through some of the opposing surfaces of the project. And here are a series of elevations um, showing different views of the house, a study model of the house. And um, the structural system in this project is kind of interesting too. It's really um, much more hybridized than the last project. There are two systems that um, kind of mingle with one another. One is um, a steel tube frame, which is making all of the geometries of the roof and um, is carried by a series of steel posts. And then onto that are um, a series of timber of framing members. In the wall, they're just conventional studs. In the roof, all of the wood sits on the outside of the steel for better thermal performance and easier constructability. Um, these are interior views, which give you um, a sense of how the artificial and natural geometries coalesce in the um, visual environment of the house. And you can see that the ceiling plane is, is um, folding up and down above you. Um, so that's the point where I sort of slide a little bit more into the kind of um, research area of the talk. Um, I'm going to speed it up because I'm talking exceptionally slow, even for myself. Um, 
Right now I'm conducting a, uh, a research studio at UCLA called the Synthetic Reel, where um, we're taking some of the research that's been done in fabrication seminars and trying to extend that into the studio where we use digital operations and actual material um, to alter the materialities or qualitative expressions of the surfaces we're making. And um, in order to sort of argue this, I used two stills from, um, from the gaming world. One is an older Super Mario Brothers that was made for Nintendo when Nintendo first came out. And when Mario moves, the environment of the game is completely absent of, of any expression or acknowledgement of force. So if Mario hits his head, um, the blocks don't deform and Mario doesn't deform. When Mario falls, it's at a constant rate. There's no acceleration, etc. This is a still from a kind of recently released uh, PlayStation game called Loco Roco, where a series of animated blobs move around in an environment of with different material states. So they, these blobs interact with water, air, gravity. Um, they roll on surfaces. They deform when they come into contact with surfaces or one another. And so um, I use these two images to, to basically discuss the fact, discuss what seems to be ever ever clearer, which is that despite our fear that digital techniques would lead to a lack of materiality and a lack of physicality, these things ever are, are actually putting more material experience into our world, not less. It's just that some of it, um, as haptic as it might be, is understood through our eyes, then our body, instead of through our bodies, and then our, our bodies first. Um, and these are sort of two examples, one from art, one from architecture, um, where I think the synthetic and the synthetic and the actual, the synthetic and the real mix to construct um, potential that neither could support alone. One is a Tim Hawkinson piece called A Motor, which was at LACMA a few years ago. Um, and media, media input basically triggers a series of actuating devices on this self-portrait. And different parts of his features um, move in relation to that data stream. And so this, the input of data, a motor, and an image produces facial expressions that aren't able to be characterized or recognized by us because they're um, only possible through the interface of the automated device and the actual photograph of the artist. And what's interesting about that piece is it evokes incredible emotions from horror to humor um, to um, dismay, et cetera. And the crowd kind of dynamically um, uh, reacts to the, the dynamic unfolding expressions. And then the other one, which is um, a Herzog and Demeron uh, <coughs> office building in Basel, is an interesting one to me because through a kind of novel material assembly and a recognition of the kind of um, reflectivity of glass, Herzog and Demeron are able to sort of construct a, a critique of and for a kind of, you know, for the length of one block, they're able to reconstruct Basel and eliminate its kind of strict uh, zoning regulations, its uh, really um, sort of 
unrelenting uh, uh, urban homoge homogeneity. And they do it just through the simple act of, of altering the image of Basel that's captured in its surfaces. And I think probably most potently the um, capacity of us to experience real things and synthetic things in the same space is, um, was presented by Cameron's avatar where here the world undergoes rapid evolution, <coughs> the forms of life and the environments in which they exist shift through strange hybridizations um, only possible with the introduction of digital effects. So the materialities associated with deep sea life and an aqueous environment combine with a lush, supersized tropical forest and its damp, moisture-saturated environment to produce a new and unfamiliar um, biome that doesn't actually, that we don't know, that, we, that doesn't actually exist on Earth, but we can nevertheless inhabit it. The effect here is uncanny. Our minds are activated um, not by the story, but with a fascination with the experience of this constructed place. So when watching it, you can feel the fluttering surfaces, experience the heavy clinging air, and um, recognize that this is a kind of cinematic equivalent to the synthetic reel. And my sort of desire for architecture is that we embrace uh, digital methods in order to construct these sort of novel um, environments that we inhabit, not without actual material, but in spite of it, or in addition to it. Um, and I'm showing just, a, I'll go through quickly and show you, um, because I want to get to some fabrication work, but um, I'll show you a series of images where uh, this kind of synthetic space of, of design and real space of construction kind of uh, enter into a feedback loop. This is a image is an image of uh, a kind of hair-like environment that's produced in monofilament for an installation um, called, as part of a show called Hairstyle. And you can see that even in its kind of physical presence, there are drawing-like qualities that this um, installation take on so that you're, there's a kind of seamless integration of the earlier study in a digital world with a kind of physical study using monofilament. And um, some of these uh, similar kind of hybrid environments are produced um, in this scheme, which I did also with Jason as part of New Form, which is our proposal for PS1. And in that proposal, we were interested in producing a kind of alternative atmosphere inside the existing <coughs> courtyard space using as much sort of lightweight, inexpensive material as we could in order to um, thoroughly uh, condition all of the space inside the courtyard. And so we used um, both a kind of understanding of, of how materials um, behave in, you know, under the force of gravity, like the canopy is a series of catenary bands, as well as um, the distribution of a, a water-based, real tangible atmosphere, and a series of objects for lounging at the 
at the kind of lowest level of the scheme. And digital techniques sort of migrated in these two layers um, in order to both help with manufacture and to help us um, uh, imagine what these uh, what these surfaces might be. So I'm going to kind of move quickly through this. These are the loungers which regulate seating in a variety of ways from a kind of open-ended platform to a more ergonomically controlled seat. And then these objects sort of reflect the presence of one another um, swelling where they meet and flattening out where, where they're distant from one another. This is what we call Purple Haze, the title of the scheme, which is um, a, a very regulated and calibrated atmosphere of water droplets <coughs> in states that range from rain to mist to fog. And that was meant to kind of cling to the underside of this surface, the canopy surface, um, which uh, was perforated to allow variable amounts of light into the space below. And we argued this scheme really based on the number of <coughs> senses that the scheme um, uh, touched and we developed all of our material choices in relation to um, maximizing the sensorial impact of the parts. So the canopies are cut, but the circular cuts are left to, um, to hang into the space to catch breezes and flutter, so that the canopy was always a kind of, always enlivened by breezes and movement across its underside. And when we argued the scheme, we basically took the jury through each of the senses and the way in which we had made choices <coughs> to sort of um, uh, provoke or uh, uh, capture that particular sense. This is a model of the kind of purple haze of that gets projected on its surfaces and inhabitants through the translucent uh, vinyl canopy. And so um, the last uh, part of the talk that I wanted to walk you through is, is all student work with the exception of one project which Anna mentioned which is Bioform. And let me exit this. Um, this is uh, work from a fabrication studio, at a fabrication seminar at UCLA, which um, really was an attempt to kind of marry the constraints of practice and um, a research agenda in the school, um, my own research agenda that I wanted to introduce to the school. And so... The course is called Between the Sheets. It's um, uh, thermofor thermoforming aluminum and plastic. And what I really was interested in doing is getting students to embrace the technologies that we had available to prototype um, <coughs> designs for uh, rain screen facades that could be manufactured using a given um, manufacturing technology and would be ready to produce as soon as the quarter was over. Um, and this was an attempt to introduce them to the shifts that occurred in, from curtain wall design to rain screen <laughs> systems and also um, to introduce them to the potential of, of highly saturated, uh, highly sa digitally saturated surfaces like that I showed in PS1. And also to the power of 
digitally controlled machinery and the kind of precision and renewed craft possible with those tools. <coughs> so I introduced them to a place called Superform USA, which is in Riverside. It's a, um, a primarily an aeronautical and automotive manufacturer that um, has the capacity to form very thin sheets of an aluminum alloy that acts ductily or, or in a plastic way under heat, uh, under the um, application of heat and pressure. So here are some of the parts they made for the Ford, um, uh, Ford GT. And here <coughs> are a series of parts for a Boeing aircraft. And they typically make doubly curved parts um, on a single-sided mold and with an incredible, uh, uh, incredible dimensional tolerance. So every part varies not more than, a, than like half a millimeter from one to the next. And um, this is sort of the contraption they use to do that. This is a um, steel chamber into which they pump gas, like air, pressure, air, to apply pressure to a sheet, which they advance over a mold. And that all happens in, um, in a large industrial oven. And this is the kind of part you get out of that process. So because in this particular process, there are a variety of constraints that are very real and are, um, you know, primarily economic. It uses, this is a process that works well when you want hundreds of parts, not tens of thousands of parts. And it's a technology that works well when you reuse molds. So it's an expensive mold to make when you need the mold to withstand high temperatures. So. I gave students a series of really strict constraints that they had to use. These are some of their prototypes. And we developed a vocabulary for talking about and thinking about the, ge the geometries that went into their design work. So um, we used plain tiling, which is a form of tessellation where you cover a surface without any gaps. In this case, this drawing is from a, a student project called Satin Sheets that uses a hexagonal tile. And they have, in the end, they have two tiles, which I'm not sure if both of them are in this drawing. I think this is only one. But we defined a tile boundary, which is the, in this case, is a hexagon. And we used what we called field line work, which is something that helps us um, disguise the boundary of a panel. We were very sensible about what we called a substrate line work, so how we were going to attach these panels to a waterproof backup wall. And then we worked on panel morphology, so how could we uh, transform a flat plane that would stretch between those tile boundaries into something else. And the objective in transforming that surface was to experiment with constructing um, in a very synthetic way um, qualities in these surfaces that didn't belong to aluminum but that were kind of hybrids of um, other things with aluminum, and in this case, this is a, a kind of fabric-like <coughs> project called Satin Sheet. This one is a sort of an, uh, one that evoked carved marble, uh, which was called Busta Line, and I didn't name any of these. This one is a latex uh, kind of effect in a project called Shiatsu. This one is a sort of weighted organic membrane in a project called Tongue and Cheek. And this is a kind of 
substance, fluid-filled organic membrane um, in a project called Intestines and Roses. <laughs> These are others which I'm skipping. And this is a project Murmur did called Bioform with Superform support. So I thought I would argue um, in, in a kind of concise way what I think are the effects and potentials of this way of working. So the students and I argued that material reality has become plastic. Design and manufacturing technology has altered materiality, breeding synthetic materiality. A constructed set of surface effects resulting from the mixture of actual um, material properties and the geometry-induced properties of digital operations. These synthetic materialities are immediately sensate and exhibit unusual qualities due to the commingling of form and representation. Drawings inhabit form first as geometric sensate matter and secondly as tool paths drawn by machines. Actual material properties become a medium for the dissemination of effects achieved through digital means. In the most captivating mixtures, the real and virtual become so intertwined that one perceives um, a synthetic materiality. In satin sheet, um, the students used a two-tile system, which yielded 72 standard panel combinations that were carefully characterized and described by its di designers. A dichroic paint finish heightens the <coughs> sensation of continual movement that the field line work instigates. Optically, the surface recedes and approaches rhythmically as one's movement <coughs> alters the surface's color. The field line work progresses linearly, curls, tangles, and moves again, depending on panel orientation and adjacency. In bust a line, a single tile system is used that uses tool inserts, um, which I'm trying to find. You can sort of see them prototyped here. And, and those um, tool inserts um, uh, alternately either enhance or diminish the legibility of the tile boundary so that the panel surface raises and lowers in relation to that hexagonal boundary. The, um, the hex, hex boundaries are pronounced or recede and become lost in the undulating, seemingly carved marble surface. Like Baroque sculpture, the fabric-like folds of the surface capture energy and appear to re be ready to reconfigure. Shiatsu um, took advantage of the duration of the thermoforming process to modulate air pressure in a series of independent chambers. So the students designed these um, kind of uh, mechanisms for distributing air pressure in a series of cells instead of globally across the part. And using these digitally controlled instructions about air pressure, the students are able to modulate surface through, through instruction choreography. The tooling cost is replaced by the in-air modulation system and it allows a sort of musical approach to the distribution of surface features. The resultant material effect looks like latex informally stretched from behind, and the features sort of rhythmically and unexpectedly emerge. Um, this is Point Blank. Point Blank um, was in a later uh, kind of iteration of this course where the students rejected um, an approach where one would use a single manufacturer and instead um, used two types of manufacturer. These four, these uh, aggregations of four panels are done using 
uh, thermoformed aluminum, these flat or slightly um, uh, deformed panels are used, are done using stamping. So they're able to develop highly organic fields and arrays because they're mixing more low-tech and high-tech, more low-cost and high-cost methods for manufacture. And in this particular version of the course, students um, had to design um, both terminations and folds so that they could um, play out the kind of experience of the skin of the building across some of the um, tropes that architects need to uh, consider when, when, when designing an elevation and having that elevation meet the sky or the ground. In tongue-in-cheek, um, uh, there's a kind of similar latex or stretched quality to the material. The panel form appears to slump under the weight of a surface within. The designers developed two tiles, one slightly convex, one slightly concave, that together generates remarkable surface undulation with a nearly indiscernible panel section. The parts, um, the features, part and zipper as the surface changes direction. And because the, um, the panel morphology breaches the sort of overlaps the <coughs> boundaries of the tile, it's um, difficult to see where one panel starts and another stops. And this is the kind of curvature that's able to be achieved just through um, a convex and a concave tile. And then in intestines and roses, um, a remarkably lush and fleshy surface is produced using geometry that imbues the surface with tension. The surfaces seem fluid filled and organic. This is a two tile system that disguises the boundaries by um, merging the three dimensional surface features with the two dimensional line of the tile boundary. So the edges, any field line work that tracks through a particular panel um, inflects the tile boundary. So it's difficult with these kind of uh, crevices to determine which one is a feature within the panel and which one is marking its edge. And the students sort of accentuated that this ambiguity by painting deep areas of the surface a darker red than the most forward surfaces. Here's a couple others. I'm slowing down. This one's Nurples. Um, Nurples is quite similar to intestines and roses, but they use a kind of painterly application of paint um, so that you're able to change colors from part to part using um, a series of masking devices and you get what looks like a kind of hand, hand looped carpet. I'm skipping this. And, and just ending with um, Bioform, which was um, the summer before last manufactured in aluminum. We were um, uh, we convinced the manufacturer to prototype a, a part in, in aluminum and using one of the kind of vacuum uh, molds that they already had. So they gave us uh, a limitation of one part and a size limitation of the panel, which is approximately 18 by 18. And we formed a one millimeter thick sheet of aluminum um, which stretched to about half a millimeter thick. It's about a 32nd um, of an inch thick. But because it's heat formed instead of cold formed, there are no residual stresses in the metal and it's strong enough to drive a car over. 
So one of the kind of incredible things about working with this material is you get an incredibly light surface that you can attach to the um, as cladding to a wall and it's incredibly strong. So this one gains its strength both through the kind of uh, molecular condition of the metal but also through its shape and through a, a series of kind of ovoid masses that are aggregated into these three-part hexagonal assemblies, we get six degrees of rotational freedom, and we really worked to, to try to modulate tone across the surface and to look for, um, because none of the students had really done this, is to look for the smallest scale of articulation that the manufacturing process could produce. And so we got to features that were like three millimeters in diameter, um, trying to make sort of jewelry scaled um, articulations in the center of these masses. And just to give you a few um, images of the way the thing was produced, there was an aluminum mold made uh, with a CNC because that was really quick and efficient. And then that mold was put into this existing um, surround and uh, individual sheets of aluminum were heated up and pressed into the mold. Um, each part took 20 minutes to make and then they're cleaned and cut and, and installed to a substrate so they can be put into the gallery. <coughs> um, these are all of the students who worked hard to do that research with me. And that's it. Questions out there that Heather can address? Yeah. Um, I thought the student was very beautiful. Um, and I was, but I was wondering, there was kind of like a slight dichotomy, to my mind, anyway, between the, the first project you showed the house and this, the, 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 the tiling systems, which are the kind of field conditions. And the house kind of stood out in its condition. I mean, it was kind of vertical and uh, and I'm just wondering whether, in retrospect, the kind of the, the subtleties of and the, the tiles is in by comparison, you couldn't even see where the joints of the tiles were. It was kind of seamless, and it was uh, uh, whether there might have been a kind of a, a tactic dealing with a, a, a planning commission who were kind of very uh, nervous about something that was different. Mm -hmm. Whether that logic of camouflage couldn't have been sort of fed into the the house um, condition as a kind of field condition, whether they would almost lose it in its landscape. Yeah, I I think if if I had been uh, more savvy, I would have definitely imaged the kind of copper patina because the, the kind of bronze coloration, the bronze and green mixture that would happen on that surface if it were, were mocked up, e either in an image or in reality, would have made the, the project I think it would have changed the way the project was received. But we were also really pushing them by having an undefined structural system, which Anders knows a lot about because GMS or designed that project for us. But um, you're right, that camouflage would have been helpful. I think I was exceptionally naive about what I was taking on and the kind of politics of the, the de development restrictions that existed on that site. So one of the reasons in the Vortex House that there are these kind of um, fleeting presentations of gable-like forms is because I wanted them to feel comfortable that from certain views, the house used or kind of in part used some conventional profiles. Um, and, you know, that was one way I did it. But I think there's also a big shift in that the, um, there's a little bit of naivete 
also on my part about the complexity of having so many variable parts in a project that you want to build at the scale of this project. And so when you're dealing with a residential project or anything large, you know, under a $200 million budget, the economies of manufacture and part, uh, part counts, these are all things that are serious demands, regardless of the ability of a CNC machine to connect, to cut absolute uniqueness. Um, so as, as easy as it is to find the machines, it's not nearly as easy to find someone willing to run the machine or someone willing to pay for the running of that machine. Come on, more questions. <laughs> Some, yep. I have a question. Um, Hi. Really great work, really interesting. And um, I, I suppose as a you know, practicing educator, um, sympathetic to the, perhaps, okay, Neil's question, the diversity of um, research on the one hand um, with its freedom but other challenges. And then the application, right? And I was wondering how you saw the future, you know, for your work, and and I assume a, a, an attempt to merge those, right, as a kind of goal. Mm -hmm. And and also, so that's the first part of where you see that would be going. And then secondly, the process of when you when you talked about the house, um, was it? Uh, Secondly, when one tackles extremely complex work, of which that is one, that the process of doing it actually, at some end, changes one, right? Of how you would approach it again, mm -hmm. or one makes a series of accomplishments through it, whether it's the tectonic level of how one actually dissects a kind of form that way. And I can tell you, your presentation is a real rigor and <coughs> kind of love of that process, actually, where and I would also maybe argue that there are others of, of, of your generation, our generation, whatever that is, who actually aren't interested in that. And so I find that also really interesting in your work. And I wonder if you could comment on that in terms of your evolution and your trajectory. Um, I have to do that carefully, I guess. <laughs> I mean. I was just, I just contributed to a conversation in log on the superficial. And the only way I could participate, first of all, I was just terribly torn about trying to write about the superficial. But um, I'm only interested, I'm most interested in how um, manipulations of surface or mass or space demand creative solutions in structural systems, in cladding applications, in how you put a, a window in a wall. And so I agree that some of, I think I'm slightly older, I think I'm slightly older than some of the people I'm frequently at, um, grouped, kind of compared to, but I also think I'm just, I'm really interested in in the spatial ramifications of this work, and that to me is only possible if we invite people to inhabit it, which is only possible if we figure out how to make it. And so I, I am um, just as interested as, uh, uh, in understanding how conventional wood framing works as I am in understanding superform technology because I'm not, I'm not nearly naive enough to think that I can do everything in special ways. And to answer a little bit about the difference between the earlier professional work and the later academic research is I'm trying to take what I learn and see how clamped down you can get the constraints and still produce kind of compelling things. And so the Between the Sheets <coughs> seminar 
was meant to do that. It's you know a highly constrained design problem, and then the results are quite varied. Um, and that's sort of I think changing how I teach a little bit. I don't know how to talk to other people's interests. <laughs> Um, what would be the next step to that? Because the, the two machines, it seems very tactile, but not completely spatial. And how would you know that start to kind of evolve to be really a spatial experience and then something you want to like touch? Mm -hmm. um, well, that that's a question that really came up in in especially the later discussions around that work. And it, it influenced how I've been designing some of my studios. Um, one of the, uh, one conversation was that was sort of, one, one point that was brought up was that that requires a kind of um, parallel development in how you approach mass, um, which the other, the backside of mass is space. So, um, so how I've been trying to do that is really develop with students mass through a series of surface exercises so that we can prepare those more um, abstract surfaces to receive the kind of panelization strategies of the tech seminar. And we're doing that with fabric. So we're basically modeling uh, building massing in sheets of fabric so that um, using uh, garment construction techniques we're able to uh, deflect those surfaces but in really highly controlled ways and my hope is that those things kind of um, those two lines of research end up um, meeting one another at some point but I've, I've turned my attention to mass because I have a sense of the part, and now we're trying to develop a language, a massing language that works with those um, sort of fabric-like surfaces. So you spoke a lot about the 3D, the built work, the manufacture of certain parts. And at the same time, the drawings that you're showing are just mind-blowingly beautiful. So there is a kind of, on the one hand, plastic obsession with the three-dimensional, and on the other hand, a total ephemeral kind of, I, I would say even stronger obsession with this kind of 2D representational technique. Mm -hmm. How do you, can you speak a little bit more about the drawings themselves and their role in the production of the architecture? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's funny because all of the drawings, almost all of the drawings are, um, are translations and, and uh, the result of operations on a three-dimensional model. So even though they look like highly worked over two-dimensional things, they were first developed in three-dimensional space and then they're sort of extracted out of that space and worked, um, layers of line work is put back into them to try to capture in a drawing the kind of effects that we imagine in the three-dimensional thing. Um, I can probably talk most uh, immediately about early fascination with drawing. Um, which led to a lot of the work in hairstyle and a lot of work that Jason and I did together because we, we were much less interested in a rendered three-dimensional object which got a kind of abstract surface quality and no articulation and no texture. We were much less interested in that than we were in the wireframes and the kind of regulating geometries of controlling those surfaces. So I think there's a lot of desire on my part to take the stuff that 
the, the digital material that exists in the 3D environment and, and let it be legible and experienced in a three-dimensional construction. And you kind of see that in a drawing because I try to keep as much of that line work and information in the way things are assembled as I can. Uh, is there been any exploration in uh, the way that it's constructed that it's not just cladding on a structure, but that the, um, these individual elements when amalgamated together actually become a structural piece? Um, I've seen lines of that research kind of happening at UCLA. I think I'm a little, I think that that's an interesting idea. I'm not so sure it's all that possible. Um, and so I avoid attempting to do it because I can't figure out how you would make that. So when you deal with the layers that go into assemblies, whether it be an insulation layer or a vapor barrier or a waterproof membrane, they're much more aggregated assemblies than they are um, single system assemblies and so I think I I try to uh, invest the surfaces with some structural integrity but I just I don't play it all the way out to be part of the kind of dead load system of a building because I I don't think our construction technologies are prepared to deal with that um, and the materials we use are not performing in the number of ways they would need to in order to do that. So it might just be a blind spot in my imagination, but um, I don't feel like it's necessary to make a wall with just one system. And I think it's actually pretty, I think the development of the curtain wall and the ability of the surface to be divorced from dead load capacities is actually still an advance in our profession <laughs> and we shouldn't we shouldn't we retreat from it <laughs> but maybe i'm just not inventive that way i'm not sure these guys might know more anyway well thank you very much